We believe that because of the depravity of the human race, our good God has ordained kings, princes and civil officers. He wants the world to be governed by laws and policies so that human lawlessness may be restrained and that everything may be conducted in good order among human beings. For that purpose, he has placed the sword in the hands of the government to punish evil people and protect the good. And the government's task is not limited to caring for and watching over the public domain, but extends also to upholding the sacred ministry with a view to removing and destroying all idolatry and false worship of the Antichrist, to promoting the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and to furthering the preaching of the gospel everywhere, to the end that God may be honoured and served by everyone as he requires in his word. Moreover, everyone, regardless of status, condition or rank, must be subject to the government and pay taxes and hold its representatives in honour and respect, and obey them in all things that are not in conflict with God's word, praying for them that the Lord may be willing to lead them in all their ways and that we may live a peaceful and quiet life in all piety and decency. Well, Jeremiah 29, 4 to 14. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give daughter, your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring, back, bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I have carried you into exile. Romans 13 verses 1 to 14. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up by this one command. 
Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, but the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Worldwide and also here in Australia, we know that there has been a real rise in the attention that citizens are focusing on governments and how they rule. And especially in Western societies where we are used to going about and doing our business freely and for the most part, government stays out of our lives. But as you may have heard the Prime Minister say on, on the TV recently, just in the last day or two, it's time for government to get out of our lives and people to be able to decide what they want to do, where they want to go, etc. But that's the, the environment we're in at the moment. Um, here we've been dealing with stuff that we're not used to. Um, in Melbourne it's been the worst of course, where there were curfews and people were confined to their homes, like home arrest, for 23 hours a day. Can you imagine that? We've, we didn't have to go through that, but in Melbourne they did. 23 hours a day they were confined to their homes, they were not allowed to leave their property. And they were allowed one hour exercise a day. It sounds like a prison, doesn't it? They were allowed one hour exercise a day, and that had to be within five kilometres of, of their home. That's what some people had to live with. Businesses were shut down. It wasn't a suggestion, it wasn't a request. They were ordered to shut down. And if they didn't shut down, then of course there were horrendous fines and even the threat of imprisonment. And subsequently, many businesses have been destroyed. Governments made those rules. Governments enforced those rules for police forces. And now, of course, most controversial of all is the vaccine mandate. Uh, governments uh, are, are saying to us that we have to be vaccinated, and if we're not, then there are uh, jobs and places we cannot have and places we cannot go. And so this is drawing out tens of thousands of protesters, as we saw in the news this morning as to yesterday. In, in Melbourne and even in Perth and elsewhere. And if that's not enough, when we think about governments and what's going on in the world today, we see the rise of China. A rise that is escalating so fast that governments around the world, including our own, are perceiving that as a threat to our safety and our security. That's led to the AUKUS agreement, that between the United States, the UK and Australia whereby for the first time since the 1950s, a foreign power is going to be given the nuclear information to be able to build nuclear submarines. This for what purpose? For strengthening the defence against a nation like China. And then also we have the rise of what's called the Quad. India, Japan, Australia, America. Again, a grouping together of nations to solidify our military capability to be able to offset the rise of China, basically. So this is governments uh, coming together to be able to deal with a government, the Chinese government. This is all happening in our time and it can be unnerving and, and we're in a situation of wondering, what are we to do with this stuff? How as Christians should we view what's going on with regard to China and the AUKUS agreement and the Quad do we support our government in entering into these sorts of agreements and the relationships with other nations? Do we agree to getting nuclear uh, submarines? And with regard to all these things that have been going on, especially the mandated vaccinations, what do we do with that? Where do we stand? One of the things that we do have to understand is that as Australians um, and even in the Western world, um, what we have in terms of democracy, being able to speak up and even being able to go out into the streets and protest, is fairly new. We think this is the way it's always been. This, this is our, our right. 
this is the way the world should be. But for most of human history, it hasn't been the case. Democracy is something fairly new. And there, even today, as you and I worship here today, there are billions of people in the world who are forbidden to worship like you and I are doing today who are commanded by this command to recognise their government, to obey their government. And as we're going to see, there are certain things we need to understand then in terms of what's God's relationship, not only to our Australian government, but what's God's relationship to the Chinese government? What's God's relationship to the North Korean government? What's God's relationship to the Saudi Arabian government and to the Iran government? In a lot of these places I just mentioned, you're not allowed to be a Christian. That can uh, indeed be a death sentence for you if you do that actively, especially if you try and evangelise. So we're going to have a look at this. What's God's relationship to all these different types of government and the way that they govern? And, and the way they govern is so different. You know, next year we go to the polls. In a lot of countries, that's not something that people are able to do. So what does the Bible say about political government and how should you and I as Christians relate to government? Well, as we take a look at our text this morning in Romans 13, let's first of all draw a context as to what was the environment in which this was written. That's really important. This was written in a book called Romans. It was written to a church or group of churches in Rome at a time when Christianity was just rising and was being persecuted. Go to the book of Hebrews and read what happened to Christians um, in, in that time and that, that era under the Roman government. People were torn in two, referring to horses, pulling bodies apart, people alive. People were sawn in two. People were used as flames, you know, bearers of flames for, for Caesar's parties. This is the empire. This is the heart of empire. This is Rome to which this letter was written. This was the time in which this letter was written. And what does it say there? Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities... For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. No ifs and buts, is there? This is written to people in Rome with this brutal dictatorship over them, putting them to death for the faith. And yet it says here, the government of Rome, the Caesars ruling in their day, they existed, how come? Because God instituted them. God brought them to power. They were God's servants in that time. Sound strange? What does it say in the book of Acts 17.26? Do you remember how Paul goes to Athens and he goes to the Areopagus and he sees all these temples to different idols, to different gods? And he sees this one, one um, particular uh, altar to the unknown god. Do you remember it? And he goes to, up to the Areopagus and he says, hey, let me tell you about the god you don't know about. And then he proceeds to tell them. And then this is in part what he says. From one man, he, that's God, made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Hear that? Paul is in Athens in the time of the Roman Empire. And what does he say? God has made all the nations. Not one of them exists because they rose up of their own accord. 
God has made all the nations, and not only has he made all the nations, he appointed in history the time that they would arise on the stage. So when you see a progress of one empire and it falls and then another empire takes its place and it falls and another empire takes its place, that doesn't just happen. God's at work, Paul is saying in, in Acts. God is bringing through history a time in which this particular nation rises up and it too will fall. That's what he says. He not only chose their time in history when they were, would appear, but he even marked out the boundaries geographically of the lands that they would rule. And remember, this is the Spirit. This is inspired Scripture. This is the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul. These powers, these governments, these nations didn't just arise at a particular time, but even where they lived was marked out by God. When we understand that, that there is no power and there is no government that exists or has existed upon earth or will exist upon earth unless God raises it up and God causes it to exist. Unless we understand that, then we can't understand how the scripture can say each one of them is his servant. Each is raised up for a purpose, not their purpose, but God's purpose. God has a plan. He wants to work through them. Romans 9, uh, 17, um, Paul talks about Pharaoh. Now, the Egyptian empire, with its different dynasties, used to be the greatest upon the earth. The pharaohs were the most powerful people upon the earth at one time. We see their pyramids and we see the riches with which they were buried. They had absolute sway over their subjects. It was a pharaoh who could say with regard to Joseph's descendants that they should become slaves and who could say that the, the male children should be put to death so that eventually the Jews would disappear. He could do that because he had the power to do that. That's how powerful the pharaohs were. But what does scripture say about pharaoh? It says in Romans 9.17, For scripture says to pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. How did Pharaoh get there? How did he arrive at the time in history he arrived? How did he, in, in Joseph's day and in Moses' day, how did he rule the land that he ruled? Because God raised him up. And for what purpose? That God's name would be broadcast throughout the earth. And it sure was, if you read through the, the books of Moses, that as the people left Egypt and as they came across country after country, they had already been heard about. And many nations feared the arrival of the Jews on their doorstep. Why? Because they had heard about their God and what he had done to the Egyptians. For this very purpose, I raised you up, that my name would be made known, that I would be glorified throughout the earth. A brutal dictator like Pharaoh it was a servant to fulfill God's purposes. And then what about the Romans? Why did they arrive when they arrived in history? Why did they end up in Palestine just when Jesus was there? Remember the discussion between Jesus and Pilate? And at one stage, Jesus wasn't answering a question. And Pilate said to him, don't, don't you realize who I am? Don't you realise I can set you free? He's talking about his power. Pilate thought he was the one in, in charge. P Pilate thought he was the one who had the power, that he was the ultimate authority at that time in that place. And what, does, what was Jesus' answer in John 19, 11? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given you from above. Ha! <laughs> Pilate, you reckon you have authority? I tell you, you wouldn't even have it if it were not given to you. It's not your power. It's God's power given to you. And for what purpose? That you would hand me over to be crucified. Look at the big picture, folks. Why the Romans at that time? Why Pilate here speaking to Jesus? Because Jesus had to go to the cross. That was God's plan. That was God's purpose. God's purpose. 
the Romans and Pilate and the Jewish leaders at their day were fulfilling God's purpose as his servants. They thought they were in charge, but God was ruling. And so the confession says, we believe that because of the depravity of the human race, our good God has ordained kings, princes and civil officers. Folks, we need to stand back sometimes from our newspapers and from what we hear and what we even say to each other and get back to the Bible. Scripture makes it quite clear God has his plans and they involve governments as his servants. Listen to Acts 2, 22, 24. Peter is speaking at Pentecost. What does he say? Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. And now listen to this. This man was what? This man was handed over to you by God. Talking about Jesus. Jesus was handed over to you by God, by his deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you with the help of wicked men put him to death, by nailing him on the cross. God's plan, God's foreknowledge. By that plan, by that foreknowledge, Jesus was handed over to the Jews, who in turn handed him over to the Romans. God's relationship to governments is absolutely clear. This is not a muddy issue, folks. That's why it says in Romans 13, Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. It's a real warning, isn't it? There is no authority that God has not instituted or established. All are his servants, all he is using to fulfill his plans. Resist the authorities, the Lord says, in terms of their right to rule, and you resist God, and you will be judged, the scripture says. Does that mean governments can do what they like? Does that mean there's no accountability? We know in Australia we have the right, don't we, to go to the the poll, we have that right next year, and um, we can kick them out of office, get a different government in. In China, you can't do that. North Korea, you can't do that. What do the Christians have to do there? Governments, even those governments that seem to rule without any accountability, will be accountable. Remember what it says in Psalm 2, 10 to 12? Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss the sun or he'll be angry with you and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So you and I who are so blessed that we can go to the polls and have a change of government. We can do that. And by God's will, if there's been a bad government, we can get it changed. But in some countries, that's not the case. What do they do? They have to leave it to God that in his time, he will judge them and he will remove them from their place in history and from their place on the earth. But in his time, just like he did with the Greeks, just like he did with the Romans, just like he did with the Egyptians. That's a hard lesson for us, isn't it? Sometimes we have to wait on God and his plans and purposes for a government. That's the way they have to live in those countries where you don't get a vote. So that's God's relationship to governments. But what about your relationship and mine? They are his servants. They will be accountable for the things that they have done. But... How are we to relate, meanwhile, to governments that God has placed over us? As I said before, sometimes when we see a government and making decisions that it's doing, 
we wonder how on earth could God allow them to rule the way they do. Well, in our first reading, we get a beautiful example of how Christians or God's people should relate to a government that's an ungodly government, an evil power, but is being used by God at a particular time in history in a particular place upon the earth to fulfill his purposes. Israel had been taken by Nebuchadnezzar into exile. Remember that? They had been brutally... They, you know, this isn't just getting onto buses and going to Babylon and living in a different place. When a nation was taken into exile, there was horrific, I mean absolutely horrific devastation brought upon the population. Pregnant women were just cut in two. You find young men, children, just cut to pieces. Only a fraction of the population went into captivity. A remnant. Nebuchadnezzar and his, his empire was known as one of the most brutal upon the earth. And God used them to take Israel into captivity. And that's where the people were. They were taken to Babylon. How should they relate to this government? Should they seek its destruction? Should they seek to somehow run a guerrilla campaign and try and overcome it? There were prophets amongst the people who were telling them that indeed they would succeed, that God would come and God would bring them back straight away, that this all would change for them. But they were deceiving prophets. They weren't sent by God. The people wanted the prophets to say the things they were saying. They were desperate for good news. What does God say to this people living under such a brutal authority? What does he say to them? Seek their peace and prosperity. That's what he says. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Can you imagine how jarring that was? Pray to the Lord for this city. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. God had said they were going to captivity for how many years? Seventy. Any prophecy that differed from that was not a prophecy from God. And these false prophets were telling them a different story than what God had said. Can you imagine how galling that would have been to the people of God? This city that has brought such devastation upon you, this city that has wiped out large numbers of your family, this city that is so oppressive in the place where you live, seek its peace and its prosperity, pray for it. How galling that must have been. But that was God's directive. Why? Because the Babylonian Empire existed because God established it. It was serving a purpose. It was fulfilling his plans for Israel. And not just for Israel, but for your salvation and mine. Because from the Jews, Christ was to come. And the way Israel had been going, they would have completely fallen away from the Lord and there would have been no Christ. The nation needed to be spiritually reformed. And so God takes them into captivity to reform them. Listen to what it says further in that passage. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then, listen to this, this is, this is what will happen in the captivity, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I'll listen to you. You will seek me and find me when, and when you seek me with all your heart, I'll be found by you, declares the Lord, and I'll bring you back from captivity. I'll gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you, declares the Lord. And I'll bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. A brutal regime takes Israel into exile for 70 years by the plan of God that Israel would be spiritually reformed, that its hearts would turn again to God, that they would once more call out to the, God, to the Lord whom they hadn't been calling out to before. They would be returned to Jerusalem. 
And from them would come the Christ. What was at stake in God using the Babylonians? Your salvation and mine. We see the same thing with Jesus. This man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan in foreknowledge and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Why did God let that happen? Why did God allow the Romans to do that? Because if Jesus wasn't put to death on the cross, you and I would not be saved. There is no government that God has not established Every government has been instituted by God and his plans and purposes are being worked through them. So what's the purpose of government that God raises up over us? It says in Romans 13, 3 to 5, Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you'll be commended, for the one in authority is God's servant for your good. So the role of government is to act in the public domain, not the spiritual domain, in the public domain. And that's why it says further on in our text, give to everyone what you owe. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. So God has instituted governments for our good, as the Confession says, because of our depravity, because of our lawlessness, God has put into place governments that make laws so that we are restricted in terms of the evil that we might otherwise do. Some might say, oh, I'm not that bad. Remember what Jesus said about the human heart? And that includes every, every human heart here this morning. He says there's nothing more deceptive than the human heart. Out of the human heart comes evil, you know, murder and adultery and theft and all that sort of stuff. That's where it all comes from. It comes from, from within us because we are fallen human beings. And that needs to be controlled. And so God has instituted governments to control our wickedness. I remember as a teenager growing up back in Sydney, and there was a time when the police in New York went on strike. Forget for how long it was. I think it was only a day or two. But I still remember vividly on the news, the reports. You know what happened? There was a huge increase in murders. Why? Because the police had been withdrawn. God has given governments the role to restrain our wickedness. He's also given governments to, to build things like roads, to provide infrastructure for the things that we need, our electricity, our water. Now, I still remember, uh, I, I'm showing my age, but when I was a kid, we used to watch Mr. Ed on TV. Wilbur was the, the city man who'd become a farmer. And he thought that as a farmer, he had special rights. He didn't need to pay taxes because he was a farmer. And so he kept plaguing the, the local shire with regard to the taxes he had to pay. So eventually they agreed that he didn't need to pay any more land rates and all that sort of stuff. And after that had been agreed, he heard this commotion outside his, his door. And he went out to take a look and there was a big backhoe out the front. And they're ripping up the road in front of his place. He says, what are you doing? He said, well, you're not paying taxes so you don't get the road. We pay taxes because God has given us governing authorities to govern. They do things we can't do independently. They do things for the common good. We expect them to make laws to, to help us in terms of domestic violence. We expect them to give us laws with regard to our protection, especially little kids like Chloe, who recently was found by the police. But also they're given the power to make laws with regard to health. And this is what we're grappling with today, isn't it? God has given government power for the common good when it comes to our health and our well-being. And so we struggle with this whole thing about vaccinations and everything else. I must admit I'm confused as to why it's such a big issue today. When I was a kid in primary school back in Eleanora, 
I remember lining up a little plastic spoon and we took the polio vaccine. No thoughts, no protests, something just needed to be done for the public good. I remember later as a vicar going through my last stage of training for the ministry. Uh, the minister I was with, who, who was training me uh, for that last stage, took me regularly on Lord's Supper visits to those who couldn't make it to the Lord's Supper. One of them was a lady in an iron lung. She was in an iron lung because she had polio and she had suffered the effect of it. She couldn't exist outside that iron lung. All you could see was her head. Governments are put in place by God to look after the common good. So when we go through these things, I'm not going to give you any answers as to whether the government should or can do vaccinations and whatever else and mandate them. But what we do need to do is be careful that we do not say for conscience sake we're going to rebel against the government and we're not going to follow its directives. Why do I say that? Because scripture tells me. Romans 13, 5 says, therefore it's necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Lots of people are saying for conscience reason, reasons I'm not going to get vaccinated. For conscience reasons, I'm not going to give a portion of my tax because I know some of my tax goes towards this, this particular activity, which I do not support. There have been people who've done that and gone to jail for it. But listen to what this passage is saying. Obey governments that God has put into authority, not only because they might punish you, but because of conscience. What's it talking about? It's talking about the clear directive that God has given us to obey the governments that he has put in power over us who are working in the sphere that he has ordained for them to work in, into the public domain for the public good. And he tells us that if we do not obey the government that he's put in, in, in place for us, then our consciences should be activated. How? Because God has said clearly, obey the government. Disobey it then you have a problem, or you should have a problem of conscience, says the Lord to each one of us. Has anyone ever considered this? I have a conscience about taking a vaccination or doing a particular thing, but what about my conscience, about the clear command, not a grey command, a clear command to recognise the power of government and to obey its directives, when that directive is not about doing something against my worship of God? So what do we owe to, to governments? We've seen there God's relationship to governments and we see there our own relationship to government. How should our relationship play out? Well, it says in Romans 13, 1, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. And I point out, even Christ did. Are there any exceptions to this rule? No. The Bible says everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. And this is in the time of the Roman government. What do we see of Jesus? They come to arrest Jesus. Peter wants to protect Jesus. Peter cuts off the ear of the, the high priest's servant. Does Jesus resist? He recognises the authority. He's God. He knows that he raised this authority. He submits to that authority because he knows what it's doing is according to the plan and the purpose of God. He goes to the cross willingly. How did they have the power to nail him to the cross? How did they have the power to lift the cross into place? How did the Romans have the power to kill him? Because Jesus consented. Jesus submitted to their authority. And take the case of the apostles. When they were brought before governors, did they resist arrest? Did they resist the commands? Listen to what Peter says. Do you remember the, the time when they healed somebody and they were called to give an account? Listen to the respect. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick, and asked how this man has been healed, 
Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Here we find disobedience, but because the command was, do not speak Jesus' name. This wasn't a health issue. This wasn't the public domain. This was a faith issue. Different thing. But even then, with respect, Peter speaks. Rulers, elders of the people. And then later on he says, you decide whether we should obey you or should we obey God. But we cannot but speak the name of Christ. The disciples submitted to the government of the day and a number of them died for the faith. They submitted themselves to death for Christ. And so submission is an important part of it. Christ submitted, the disciples submitted. But let's understand that one of our greatest responsibilities to government is prayer. And here's the question we should all face. How often do we pray constructively for government? Not that they be wiped out, that God deal with them and God punish them. But how often do we submit for our government in the way the Bible says we should pray for them? Listen to this from 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 2. I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Sounds like Jeremiah's day, doesn't it? Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city, pray for it. It says here that we should pray for those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. That's a real reflection of those in exile in Jeremiah's day. Listen to this. Isn't it true that we are in exile too? We were exiled from the garden, weren't we? Adam and Eve were cast out. We remain in exile. We're not in paradise. We're waiting for Christ's return so that we can be brought back from our exile and taken back to heaven. Isn't that what Jesus said to the disciples? I go to prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also. We're not there yet. We're in exile. We're in the same situation in a way than the people in Jeremiah's day. If you go on to the rest of what we read in Romans 13, verses 14 and verse 11, you and I must recognise the era in which we live. We're living in the last days. Paul writes there, we're nearer to the day of Christ's return than, than we were when we first believed. It's getting close to the return of Christ. We saw that in our last service, didn't we? And we need to be people clothed with Jesus. We need to be living as Christians who have a whole different view of these things than those who don't believe. Like those in Jeremiah's day, we need to get on our knees. We need to acknowledge those that God has put in power over us. We need to acknowledge the realm of their authority, the scope of their authority. And we need to submit to them in that area where God says we need to submit, not trusting them, but trusting God. Governments do get it wrong sometimes. But what does scripture tell us? What does the song we sang tell us? This is my father's world. Oh, let me not forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. So there's a lot to unpack there, isn't there? Governments are God-ordained. They arrive on Earth's timeline at the time he appointed in the ge geographical place that he set for them. And whether they are good democratic governments, whether they're bad democratic governments, whether they are dictatorships, the people are told. Acknowledge, understand they exist because God's put them there. That's come before God when we have these struggles about commands of a government. Ask for wisdom. Lord, is this something that I should re, uh, refuse? Is this something that has to do with the faith? Is this something that has to do with my acknowledgement as to who you are? Does this have to do with my freedom of worship? Or is this properly in the domain of the government to tell me to do? That requires 
wisdom. But let's not forget too that our conscience needs to be in place when there is a clear directive. Let your conscience be in gear when it comes to disobeying God about the role of the government. All too many people forget it. But let's never forget that when things seem out of control and things seem scary like the rise of China, we've got nothing to be afraid of. It's all in God's hands. It's all working out according to God's plan. And all is working for his glory. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we give you thanks that when we come to an issue as complex and as difficult as this, that there are clear directives that you give to us. And we ask that you'll forgive us when we forget that particular governments, especially those that we might despise, that they've been brought onto the timeline of history by you yourself for the purpose and plan that you have not only for them but also for us. Lord, help us to have the wisdom to know what is the, the scope of the area of their authority? Let us understand where it is where we must respectfully disobey, especially when it comes to matter of the faith, what we believe about Jesus, what we believe about you, what we believe about our need to worship. Help us to have the wisdom too, Lord, to know when we need to submit, even if we disagree with directives that they give, that uh, fall within the domain that you have said that they have power and authority. Lord, this is a wisdom we so often lack. Grant us humility. Grant us a, a conscience with regard to obeying the government that's alive and well. And Lord, we, we pray that in whatever we choose to decide, whether it comes to vaccination or anything else, that our decision is not about our pet theories and uh, about our pet likes or dislikes, but it's about you, what you have commanded and what brings you glory in this world. This we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen.